In recent past China has been very aggressive in its posturing, and has shown intent in expanding its spheres of influence. There has been several border incursions and standoffs. In this video, we have listed five weapons that India is deploying to meet the Chinese challenge. The weapons are listed in increasing order of impact. Number 5 India is buying 145 M777 guns at a cost of about $750 million from America's Bay Systems. The M777 Howitzer, a towed 155mm artillery piece, is a successor to the M198 Howitzer. It is manufactured by Bay Systems Global Combat Systems Division. Under Make in India initiative, the guns assembly, integration and testing will be shifted to India. This is first major buy for the Mountain Strike Corps. Note that, the Mountain Strike Corps has been specially raised to defend India's border with China. Artillery pieces don't get much limelight when compared to fighter jets or missiles, but are one of the most effective weapons in large-scale wars. They can obliterate armored regiments or infantry divisions, and can block the enemy from capturing territories. The M777 is designed with weight and size in mind. It is lighter than any other 155mm howitzer, having a weight of only 4,100 kg. The lighter weight and smaller size allows the M777 to be transported by the C-17 and C-130J aircrafts, CH-47 helicopter as well as trucks with these. Number 4 Chinese Navy has large number of surface ships as well as submarines. To counter this India has acquired 8, P-8 I Poseidon, and has approved further purchase of 4 more which will be delivered next year. P-8 I, is a customized export variant of the P-8 A, for the Indian Navy. The P-8 Poseidon is developed for the United States Navy by Boeing. It conducts anti-submarine warfare, anti-surface warfare, and shipping interdiction, along with an electronic signals intelligence, ELINT, role. It is equipped with Raytheon APY-10 multi-mission surface search radar, and many other sensors to detect surface and underwater vessels. It carries torpedoes, depth charges, SLAMER missiles harpoon anti-ship missiles, and other weapons for offensive intervention. Having a combat radius of 2,222 km, it is ideal for patrolling the vast Indian Ocean region, and neutralizing enemy vessels. Number 3 Brahmos is the only supersonic cruise missile in the world. It is jointly developed by Russia and India. It has a range of 295 kilometers and travels at speeds of 2.8 to 3 Mach. It can be launched from submarines, ships, aircraft or land. Its speed provides little reaction time to enemy air defenses. Guided by navigation satellites, its own inertial navigation system or independent radars, it can precisely hit its target. India has deployed BrahMos in three platforms, which are as follows. 1. Kolkata class destroyers is equipped with BrahMos, and will be guided by very powerful, MF Stars radar. 2. BrahMos has been fitted, and successfully fired from India's frontline fighter, Su-30 MKI. 3. Army is inducting a regiment of land-launched BrahMos, in Arunachal Pradesh along the China border. Chinese do not have a defense against Brahmos. There is only one defense system in the world, known to have high chances of defending against Brahmos, that is, Barak 8, which is jointly developed by India and Israel. Number 2 INS I Hand is the lead ship of India's Ari Hand class of nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines. 
the 6,000-ton vessel was built under the Advanced Technology Vessel Project. It is India's first nuclear-powered submarine. Construction of three more submarines of this class is also underway. It has four vertical launch tubes, which can carry 12 smaller K-15 missiles, or four larger K-4 missiles. K-15 is a nuclear-capable submarine launched ballistic missile with a range of 700 kilometers. K-4 is an intermediate-range nuclear-capable submarine launched ballistic missile having an effective range of 3,500 kilometers. India currently possesses the ability to launch nuclear weapons from land and air. Our re hand armed with K-series missile will complete the nuclear triad with the capability to launch nukes from sea. This way India will have a very reliable second strike capability and deter China from any misadventure. Number 1 Agni-5 is an intercontinental ballistic missile developed by the Defence Research and Development Organisation DRDO, of India. Though the reported range of Agni-5 is 5,800 km, it is widely believed that Agni-5 has a range of 8,000 to 10,000 km. Even with stated range of 5,800 km, it can hit most parts of China. It carry a 1.5-ton warhead, has a speed of 24 Mach and accuracy of less than 10 meters. Though exact details are classified, it is widely speculated that Agni-5, feature multiple independently re-entry vehicle, MRFs, with each missile being capable of carrying two to five separate nuclear warheads. It is India's most powerful deterrence against any Chinese aggression. Above the clouds, high in the Himalayas, the old Silk Road climbs through 14,000 feet to the Natula Pass, where two immense nations meet. It's here that India comes face to face with China. Forty years ago, they fought a fierce frontier war. Now, finally, the border is reopening for trade. Symbol of epic change in both countries as they dash for growth and new riches. India and China together will shape much of this century for all of us. But who will be the winners and losers as they race each other to the top of the world? I'm setting off on a journey through China and India to watch the race unfold. First Shanghai and the Chinese sprint from the very start. The airport train pushes through 430 kilometers per hour 270 miles per hour for a mere eight-minute journey. Impressive, undoubtedly. Vitally needed, hardly. But this train is a political statement. Be amazed, be very amazed by China's rise. Once China decided it wanted the fastest train in the world, there didn't need to be any public discussion. This isn't a democracy. In a one-party state, what the government wants, the government gets. The train seems to shout to the world, we're overtaking you all. Arriving in India is a very different story. This doesn't immediately look like a country on a dash for growth. A taxi in Mumbai, the country's commercial capital, gives me far too much time for a close-up view of slums and jams. Most of India's roads are hopelessly inadequate, part of a lousy infrastructure. But what's holding India back? Partly it's the need to persuade people in overcrowded areas like this to move out of the path of modernization. They can't be forced out of the way. It's called democracy. But how does it look to those creating the Hi. new wealth? Hi. Nice to meet you. What do you think would suit me? Um, I can do all kinds of shoes. I like these ones. These yeah. are really smart. Mm -hmm. In Shanghai, Billy Wang's handmade shoes tell a powerful tale. Billy took me to his small factory, a tiny but thriving part of China's manufacturing boom. His workers copy from photos their customers' favorite shoes. It's all imitation, not innovation. 
The business is expanding very fast, like all Chinese manufacturing. And Mr Wang certainly doesn't question China's system, which helps make him rich. I'm just a shoemaker. I just worry about my shoes. Nothing else matters to me. I just want to make good shoes. How much does your business and your future success depend on China's government? According to the Chinese way of thinking, the political system is decisive. Everything else comes second to this. And that's the message big picture China tells you too. In the new Shanghai, with its soaring temples of capitalism, the fast track to wealth has been produced by a rigid political system, communist in name only now. Shanghai's international port is part of national success built on an unwritten deal. Business stays out of politics, especially when the political system delivers so much. The port director told me he's immensely proud of what's been achieved. This area is for refrigerated containers. Over there, those are for hazardous materials. Most of these are for normal dry goods. This whole port was built in 1990. Every year, we're growing by 25%. More than that, it's largely one-way traffic here. China doesn't buy much overseas, but produces vast quantities of goods for sale. China's achievement is simply staggering single-minded, one-party government making clear decisions which mean that China dominates the export world. It's staggering to watch this. Containers coming on and off ships simultaneously, most of them coming into China empty, most of them going out crammed with Chinese exports. This isn't something that should worry just India. It worries economies across the world. A huge trade imbalance. Basically, we have a lot of uh, construction going on right now, just before the monsoons. But in India, young risk-takers are not dismayed by China's success. The story of Tarun Tadani in Mumbai is typical. All our, all our designs are basically finalized. Tarun is a man in a hurry to share in India's consumer boom, happening now. Tarun, still only 22, cut short studies in America to create this fashion accessories business. And the emphasis here in his design room, unlike China, is on innovation, not imitation. Next door in the workshop, a small team churns out low-cost fashion accessories for eager buyers among India's spreading middle class. Tarun insists India's cheap labour, combined with superior design skills, make a winning formula. We, we never copy directly. We spend so much time, so much, I mean, consistently trying to make new products, you know, new designs, new things out there, finding new trends, you know, just keep developing in new, new styles. So is this an exciting time to doing business in India? It's an exciting time because you can see things happening, you know. India is moving very fast, but it's like, it's like a boat. But if we don't, if we can sail or we can even sink. I can't speak for the future, but I can definitely say it is, it is definitely bright. It's a, it's a good path and I think we are, we are on the right track. And big picture India? Well, that stress on skills drives heavy industry too. Here at Mukan Steel, they can't compete with China's bulk bog standard production. Instead, they make only high value specialist steels meeting Europe's most exacting standards. I'll tell you, life does not get hotter than this. At the heart of a steelworks in India, midsummer, it's almost unbearable. But the Indians are justifiably proud of what they're doing here, not just competing with huge producers like China with a massive output of bulk commodity steel, but here making some of the world's finest high-grade steel competing with anything that could be produced in other parts of the industrialized world. Most of this steel meets India's enormous demands, but also goes for export. This is an area of heavy industry where India sees opportunities for massive growth over the next 10 or 15 years, and where the Indians are convinced they have a huge edge over China. Outside, away from the intense heat, I hear some fighting talk from the marketing director, India can catch up and then overtake China. And I don't think China can sustain 
this kind of high growth rate here for next three to five years. Is India While India's uh, growth rate for last uh, year was 8.5 percent GDP, the current year has begun with 9.5 percent in first two months. And I think as we go along, we see acceleration of the growth rate as all the industry segments are. Gna. And fighting poverty means giving children skills which could lift them to jobs inside India's urban-led boom, an escape route from very low wages working the land. What would you spend it on? As it is, the headmaster sometimes despairs at the risk of perpetual poverty here. Because uh, uneducated parents, uh, they are not sending their children uh, properly to the school. Uh, absent is uh, their uh, children uh, absent is one. They are uh, at least continually, uh, continuously, uh, nearly 10 to 15 days they are absenting. By that way, we will not understand uh, lessons properly. But if they get better educated, will that give them a different chance in life than their parents? I mean, is the future for them better? Definitely, sir. Definitely. Now look at this. Still India, but the contrast could hardly be more extreme. This is the breath-catching campus in Bangalore of Infosys, India's own homegrown software giant, and a major contributor to India's explosive growth. We have a faculty of 180 people who are faculties in computer science. This is possibly the largest computer science faculty anywhere in the world. Mohandas Pai, Infosys director, is showing me a vision of India's future. And the biggest emphasis of all here, no question, it's on teaching. Taking the highest achievers among India's college leavers to even greater heights. They see no limits to the country's future or their own. I want to leave a mark. I'm looking at making a difference somewhere down the line. It's not like everything is already done. So there is there's so much that's yet to be discovered, that's yet to be tapped. So that way, there's, there's a lot of scope to make a difference. Is this an... Number five. Since 1970s, lot of progress have been made in SAM, surface-to-air missile technology. SAMs play a very important role of anti-area slash access denial. Any area defended by a modern SAM, like S-400, is very hard to penetrate, even by the most technologically advanced aircrafts. These systems are also economically more viable, as a missile costing $0.2 to $0.8 million can take out a $30 to $50 million plane. To defeat these systems, a new category of air-to-land missile have been developed, they are designated as anti-radiation missile ARM. They are commonly carried by special aircrafts in sea drole. Currently only a handful of countries, like the US, Germany, Russia and Brazil have built this kind of missile. Number 4. All SAM need radars for targeting. ARM are designed to pick up signals or radiations from radars and communication facilities, and then target them leading to their eventual destruction. The primary purpose of this type of missile is to degrade adversaries' air defenses in the first period of a conflict, in order to increase the chances of survival for the following waves of strike aircraft. They can also be used to quickly shut down unexpected surface-to-air missile sites during an air raid. Number 3. The Defense Research and Development Organization, DRDO, is working on anti-radiation missile, and is named as New Generation Anti-Radiation Missile, NGARM. It is expected that the maiden flight test, will be held by the end of 2016. The Indian Air Force would be inducting this missile within two years, following the completion of all the developmental trails. The missile is of indigenous development, including its seeker. This seeker is placed in the front end of the missile, and picks up various radio frequencies. Number 2 The missile is a single-stage, solid-fueled system, and will be using dual-pulse propulsion system instead of thrust propulsion. This is the first time the audio is using a dual-pulse propulsion system. The missile will initially coast by firing the first pulse, the second pulse will be initiated, 
just before interception of the target, that is the terminal phase. The missile has a range of 100 km to 125 km. Number 1 the missile will be mounted on India's frontline air superiority fighter the Sukhoi Su-30MKI, and the indigenous multi-role fighter, HAL LCA. Currently the Air Force equips its Su-30MKI fighters with, the Russian KH-35 missile, and uses the French Martel anti-radiation missile, on its Jaguar and Mirage aircrafts. The Air Force is negotiating to buy AGM-88, missiles from the US, and plans to induct more than 1,500 in the next five years. It is expected that once the indigenous missile is developed, it will be used in conjugation with the above-mentioned missiles. Thanks for watch.